that's what he's talking about in section 13 on page 52. Um, says there are uh, two sorts of things that we need to keep in mind, two parts of the social practice, in this case, the practice of punishment. The first, that which is relatively permanent in it, the practice, the act, the drama, a certain strict sequence of procedures um, that are relatively permanent and constant over time. So there's, you might say that these are the outward behaviors, the, the, the publicly observable actions, in this case of punishment, that are relatively constant over time. And on the other hand, there's that which he says is fluid in it, namely the meaning, the purpose, the expectation tied to the, to the execution of such procedures. Okay, so the thought is that the custom, the act, the practice of punishment existed long before the purpose and value and meaning that we now give to the thing um, before those purposes and values emerge. Um, in other words, he says, um, very top of 53, things are not as our naive genealogists of morality and law have thus far assumed, all of whom thought of the procedure as invented for the purpose of punishment, as one once thought of the hand as invented for the purpose of grasping. Now, as for that other element of punishment, which is fluid, its meaning, like the purpose, the value, why we do this, in, the, in a very late state of culture, for example, in present-day Europe, the concept of punishment, in fact, no longer represents a single meaning at all, but rather an entire synthesis of meanings. The previous history of punishment in general, the history of, it, of its exploitation for the most diverse purposes, finally crystallizes into a kind of unity that is difficult to dissolve, difficult to analyze, and what must emphasize is completely and utterly undefinable. Today, it's impossible to say for sure why we actually punish. There are lots of different meanings and values and purposes that we think this inherited practice has, but these different meanings and purposes often conflict with one another. Some are not at all convincing. Some, conf some conflict with the actual practice. And so when we ask why, what the current justification of engaging in this practice is, it's very, very difficult to see. But, he says, so, sorry, so let me just say, and this, I want to say again, holds in general for social practices. He's interested in this one, but the relative um, stability of outward practices masks changes in the internal meaning and purpose of this. Okay, well, so on to section 14. One of the meanings or purposes that punishment is supposed to have for us today, so if we think about what, what value does punishment have, why do we engage in this practice, one of these strands, one of these meanings is that, on uh, page 54, Punishment is supposed to have the value of awakening in the guilty, sorry, in the guilty one, the feeling of guilt. Okay, so one of the meaning, one meaning of punishment for us today is that it's supposed to arouse the feeling of guilt in the perpetrator, in the one who is being punished. Make him feel guilty about what he's done. One seeks in it the true instrumentum of that reaction of the soul called bad conscience, or the pain of conscience. Okay, um, but Nietzsche thinks this is completely ridiculous, that actually punishing individuals does not generate feelings of guilt in them. Uh, 
Quite the contrary. And he says, precisely among criminals and prisoners, the genuine pang of conscience is something extremely rare. The prisons, the penitentiaries, are not the breeding places where this species of gnawing worm most loves to flourish. In fact, he says, if we look back over uh, history, we'll see this confirmed, that the infliction of punishment did not create feelings of guilt. In fact, he says, it was, um, line 30 on page 54, it was through punishment that the development of the feeling of guilt has been most forcefully held back, at least with respect to the victims on whom the punishing force vented itself. So when someone is punished, they precisely don't feel guilty about it. For let us not underestimate, he says, the extent to which the to which precisely the sight of the judicial and executive procedures prevents the criminal from feeling his deed, the nature of his action, as in itself reprehensible. So if the thought is that you should that, that you should feel guilty for doing a certain thing, that a certain kind of action is intrinsically wrong, and therefore you should feel guilty for doing it. Well, having official mechanisms and procedures impose similar kinds of acts on you, like confining you, taking away your freedom, taking away your property, physically injuring you, all these are going to say to the, um, the criminal, that those kinds of actions are not intrinsically wrong. That there is no reason for you to be guilty. Uh, the, the, actions is judging, the actions of his judge in no way reject and condemn those actions in themselves, but rather only in a certain respect and application. So, um, this is not, he says, uh, the origin of this idea of guilt. And in fact, section 15 says, um, for thousands of years, instigators of evil overtaken by punishment have felt no different than Spinoza with regard to their transgression. Namely, here's what people think when they've uh, transgressed in some way. Quote, something has unexpectedly gone wrong here. Not, I should not have done that. They submitted themselves to the punishment as one submits to a sickness or a misfortune or to death with a certain kind of fatal. So it's, a, of course, the, the moralized worldview that treats an individual as having free will so that that individual could have done otherwise and is therefore blamable. So this other alternative here is to recognize that sometimes things go wrong and some kind of uh, maybe payment is required, um, but this isn't based on an, an idea of um, guilt associated with free will. Generally, the end of section 15, generally he says what can be achieved among humans and animals through punishment is an increase of fear, a sharpening of prudence, mastery of the appetites. Punishment thus tames man, but does not, does not make him better, uh, in quotes. So better would mean you're feeling guilty. Um, but look, uh, this kind of this kind of punishment, so, sorry, let me be clear. So Nietzsche is saying that punishment doesn't generate feelings of guilt, but it does affect people's behavior. It does steer them away from certain kinds of um, behavior that gets punished, so it makes them more prudent. It lets them master their appetites more, increases their fear. Um, and so 
which is not entirely opposed to that, or at least at one point. You remember that uh, punishment is, or at least was, necessary in order to, among other things, make individuals masters of themselves so that they are entitled to promise, so that they can become sovereign individuals able to control themselves, to control their emotions, and to um, not be pushed around by their um, you know, reactive emotions. Um, so Nietzsche is not entirely opposed to that, or at least at a certain stage, it, he thinks it was necessary in order to make people prudent, in order to help people master their appetites, to become sovereign individuals. But this has nothing to do with the idea of guilt. It certainly has nothing to do with the idea of moralized guilt. OK, so finally, section 16. So what is the origin of this idea of guilt? Line 20 here on page 56. It says, I take bad conscience to be the deep sickness into which man has fallen under the pressure of that most fundamental of all changes he ever experienced. The change of finding himself enclosed once and for all within the sway of society and peace. Just as water animals must have fared when they were forced either to become land animals or to perish, so fared these half animals, like half animals, half persons, who were happily adapted to wilderness, war, roaming about, adventure. All at once, all of their instincts were devalued and disconnected. When? When they entered into society. Uh, line 35. I do not believe that there has ever been such a feeling of misery on earth, such a <coughs> leaden discomfort. And yet, those old instincts had not, at all, had not all at once ceased to make their demands. So the instincts and drives that led people to act out in the wilderness, without conscience, on others, in society they get repressed, they get limited. People are no longer able simply to act out on their uh, animal instincts and drives. And yet, those drives and inclinations are still there. It's just that it was difficult and seldom possible to yield to them. For the most part, they had to seek new and, as it were, subterranean gratifications. We're not allowed to act out on our drives, our aggressive instincts. They're redirected. All instincts that do not discharge themselves outwardly turn themselves inward. This is what I call in the, the internalizing of man. Thus, first grows in man that which he later calls his soul. So these, so in society, these aggressive instincts are no longer able to be discharged outwardly. Nietzsche thinks they're turned inward against ourselves. This is the internalization of our instincts, and thus, uh, first grows in man that which he later calls his soul. So it's this turning our own aggressive instincts inward on ourselves is what gives us psychological depth. It's what makes us something other than mere animals. It's what Nietzsche thinks in a certain form makes us sovereign individuals, not allowing us to take the case of promises. So we promise something, and then later when it comes time to act on that, and we have drives and instincts and desires contrary to what we promised, we discipline ourselves. We conquer those contrary fears. Right? We are aggressive toward our own <coughs> contrary desires. We overpower them. So